ladies and gentlemen, we are very fortunate, rather honored to have uh, Professor E. No as a speaker. Uh, she is a prominent scholar and diplomat uh, who served as a Korean ambassador to Russia and Finland. And also, she taught at Seoul National University, Korea, Korea University, and also Barnard University in the United States. And she also served as the president of a Korea Foundation. Uh, she was educated at uh, Seoul National University and Wesley and Harvard University. She's a Russian history specialist, and she's going to share with us some of her thoughts on very uh, interesting and controversial topic of uh, uh, rewriting Korean history. So without further ado, uh, Professor Ino. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. As a matter of fact, I used to be a member of this society before I went away. Well, my presentation tonight is not going to be as scholarly or as well organized as those that you are accustomed to hearing. But I'm addressing a topic which is very much to my heart. And uh, so what I say tonight will be really something that's impressionistic and personal rather than anything based on scholarly research. After all, I'm a Korean who has lived for 70 years and most of those years were spent in my own country, of course. And uh, unfortunately, the Korea we see today is not exactly what I had hoped to see. As you all know, only a few years ago, Korea was looked upon as a great success story. This country has achieved, finally, the country succeeded in democratizing its political system and also from a very poor war-torn country it has risen to be one of the big economic entities in the world. As all of you here know, this country was built up from scratch after the country was liberated in 1945. And the United States, which was the country most instrumental in uh, defeating Japan and liberating Korea, was also the power that has given the foundation upon which the Republic of Korea was built and save this country from a certain destruction during the initial few months of the Korean War and has also helped to develop its economy and also uh, inspired to achieve democratization. But now, as you all know, anti-Americanism has risen so sharply over the past several years that I'm sure our American friends all feel enormous sense of betrayal. And there are actually many, many Koreans who share this feeling. But it is at this point very important to understand uh, why this is happening so that we can move from this point on in the direction in which this, what to my mind is a rather worrisome trend, will not continue in force. And I thought, as a historian, the best way to understand what is going on is again going back to our history and see what kind of history we have really lived through. 
I'd say this is country. Korea is a country which is now engaged in, in a search for identity. It may sound strange, but it really is the word. And I called the, uh, the talk tonight rewriting Korean history because this is the attempt that is going on. And there's enormous controversy. And the controversy is, is, is in fact, uh, an understatement. There is a genuine war. Well, Korea, as you know, was a small country, hardly known to the world outside, until China began to collapse under the impact of Western inroads. And as a small country that used to live under the Chinese umbrella, Korean, Korea's intellectual establishment, which was at that time synonymous with a political class, didn't know what to do. So the first slogan was really uh, to do everything to oust whatever was, uh, well, the, what is an equivalent of, of uh, the evil, the foreign evil. But there were Koreans who were more enlightened and uh, saw the need to modernize this country. But it was already too late by the time this realization came. Korea was forced to open its ports to foreign countries, starting with Japan and then uh, with the United States, um, England, and so forth. Already at that time, the old elite was caught in a dilemma, especially after the country fell to Japan in 1910. By the Confucian standard, betraying your king or your country was tantamount to uh, really uh, ceasing to be a decent human being. But on the other hand, even before that, those who were uh, <laughs> aware of the need to modernize the country, knew that some sort of a compromise had to be worked out. And uh, China was not such an easy overload. And so naturally, there were groups of young politicians who thought that working with Japan might be the better road to travel. So when the country fell, the old establishment was caught in a no-win situation. Those who were thinking in moralistic terms had no choice but to flee the country or just become internal emigre. The other road was collaboration with Japan. Even in the younger generation, you had to accept the colonial system to get the education needed to build up Korea's real strength. So the modernizers were blamed for putting up with the situation and betraying the country, while the old guard had a moral mandate, but they were helpless. You may be amused to hear that Ihua University, the Ihua educational establishment, started with a class in which the concubine of a modernizer was the only pupil. And in fact, uh, uh, many Korean women, the first generation of Korean women who uh, got modern education, got their education because they jumped out of the old uh, hierarchical uh, and conventional uh, concept of family living. So. Uh, by the time their education was finished, they were too old to find a husband. And very often, they ended up become, becoming the second wife who had to get rid of the legitimate first wife. So this is a sort of symbolic of the conflict that this country faced from early on. 
when uh, regaining independence was the uh, foremost uh, goal, there was at least a national consensus within. There were, of course, always people who thought of their personal um, advantages. I mean, after all, life had to go on. But still, underneath it all, even those who seemingly collaborated with the Japanese were also uh, Korean patriots in their own way. And very often, the style of living was such that a Korean businessmen would uh, bribe the Japanese authorities, make money, and then send money to those who are fighting for independence abroad. Christianity and communism came in as the two new rays of hope. As you know, the Russian Revolution uh, took place in 1917, and immediately uh, Lenin sent out messages to those uh, peoples like Koreans uh, living under foreign oppression. So the twin formula of liberation from what they call feudal oppression and national oppression and collaborating with the national bourgeoisie was a formula very cleverly designed to win the hearts of the uh, nationalistically minded new intelligentsia in this country. Christianity was the other uh, message, but of course, as being religion, uh, they were more devoted to the cause of enlightenment and, uh, and social welfare and so forth, uh, rather than uh, sending out straightforward uh, political message. So when the country was liberated and then divided in 1945, maybe South Korea had more pro-Marxist uh, intellectuals than North Korea because there were richer families here uh, uh, who could afford to send their children to universities in Japan or uh, Japanize the university here. The division was something that was, of course, totally unexpected, a shattering blow. But in retrospect, division was a development that Koreans could not have prevented. Cold War had already started. And uh, the United States, of course, was not about to give up the entire Korean Peninsula, a former colony of Japan, which they had to fight so hard to defeat. Russians had declared the war only after the Hiroshima bombing when Japanese surrender was already a foregone conclusion. But Russians were right across the border and they quickly marched in while the Americans were still in Okinawa. So when the situation uh, seemed as if the division was going to last. Well, this is something that, of course, um, the leaders at that time did not see. The Americans being, uh, well, Americans, <laughs> they were straightforward in issuing, for instance, statement. They treated Korea as the former colony of a defeated enemy, whereas the Russians were much more clever in the wording of the proclamation they styled themselves out to be the army of liberation. We are here only to help you build your own country. And we are all for uh, uh, sponsoring all nation, all, all, nation, uh, you know, uh, all party uh, government. Well, I don't think neither, uh, uh, um, you know, neither Russia nor uh, Americans really wanted to uh, see this country divided. But neither side was willing to see the other half of the peninsula to the other side. Our national leaders, to the very end, were hopeful that the vision could be avoided. Dr. Singh Man Ri, who, is a, who was a Princeton PhD, was perhaps the only one of our old, um, older generation leaders who saw the nature of Stalinist system and uh, he was determined from the beginning 
to prevent communization of southern part of the country. The Americans had really no uh, love for Singman Rhee, who was very obstinate. And uh, he was really uh, a very hard bargainer. Yet, after all, he was the person who understood the American, uh, America's need not to yield to the Soviet Union. So he became the first president of this country, whereas uh, North, uh, the Russians had chosen Kim Il-sung, who was one of the many Koreans who had fought in the Soviet or Manchurian territory and had uh, served as a junior officer in their army. There were other communist leaders with much greater prestige and uh, domestic following like Park Kon Yong. And uh, to the Soviets, of course, Park Kon Yong was not such a palatable figure because he had too much independence. It would have been something like a Tito. So they chose Kim Jong Il. But in the written language, it looked as if the Soviets were out of the scene and uh, North Korea was being organized by the Koreans themselves, whereas South had to put up with American military government until the republic was established. I'm mentioning this because all these are coming up in this current debate reinterpreting Korean history. Also, in North Korea, a much uh, neater job was done in getting rid of what was called the Japanese collaborators. After all, when you introduce um, a communist system or para-communist system, you get at anybody who is property, and naturally, those who had anything had to have compromise with the Japanese. But even in North Korea, they made exception of those who had joined the Communist Party and also those who were regarded to be as desirable human material. But in the South, the Americans did not really understand the, uh, the deeper uh, sense of, or the, the deep sense of resentment the Koreans uh, had to other Japanese or Japanese collaborators. The urgent need was to uh, restore and maintain order, and only those who had been trained under the Japanese were capable of undertaking the task. And uh, the communist provocation was there from the beginning. It was a situation when anybody, regardless who it was, who uh, succeeded in becoming the uh, foremost political leader of the president, was to be blamed for having sold the country for the sake of power, or for, the, for having sold the half of the country for the sake of power. Already when uh, President uh, Seung Man Rhee became our first president, he chose to take the Korea issue to the United Nations, and uh, the United Nations accepted this proposal and uh, uh, wanted to have nationwide election, but the Soviets blocked entry of the, um, the United Nations supervising team. So election could take place only in the South. So the two separate political systems had, be, uh, had to be established in 1948. Actually, in actuality, by that time, Stalin had already uh, uh, um, seen the um, draft of North Korea's constitution, and North Korea already had uh, People's Army and all the trappings of the um, of new state. But in record, it appears as if it was Seung Man Ri who made a speech uh, in 1947 calling for the need to uh, establish an independent government and get rid of the American military government. So uh, now in the, uh, the revisionist circles, he is blamed for the permanent division, whereas Kim Gu and Kim Gyu Shik, two of the um, leaders who went to uh, North Korea on the eve of the election and uh, uh, to, uh, to parley for 
to prevent the division of the uh, peninsula, uh, and boycotted the election. They are now made out to be the, the genuine uh, national leaders. But in actuality, there are documents which prove that uh, the Soviets themselves, uh, the, in, in fact, the Politburo itself uh, thought about this issue when Kim Gu wanted to come to North. Already, because the North Korea state had uh, been uh, effectively set up, but they, in the end, decided to uh, pretend to have this nationwide conference because that would have great propaganda value. So Kim Gu was used for this propaganda purpose. And uh, yet, even today, he's made out to be the leader who selflessly uh, abstained from becoming the president or, um, and uh, wanted to resist the division. Well, all this went on, but all the time, there were guerrilla war warfare and also fights on behalf of, well, anti-communist uh, forces here because the border uh, called the 38th parallel was still porous. And uh, so those who saw what was happening in North Korea, those who had anything uh, and who could flee fled to the south. So we had a very strong core of anti-communist uh, forces here in the south. But also there were pro-communist, pro-Marxist forces fairly well organized through their um, party system. So there were fierce fights. I entered sec um, junior high school in 1949 and uh, I heard that on the high school uh, campus, there were fights with knives. And uh, during the Korean War, when it uh, broke out on June 24th, 25th in 1950, Seoul was occupied for about three months, as you know. And one of the student leaders um, was executed on the campus uh, during these three months. So the fighting was fierce, and not only that, in some parts of Korea, election couldn't take place, like Jeju Island was off limits. And in order to uh, reclaim Jeju, the new Korean government had to uh, send forces, but those military units that were supposed to go to Jeju revolted in uh, the southern um, city of Yosu and Suncheon, so there was huge uh, fight and bloodshed. And to this day, memory of all these events where many civilians were involved really without realizing what was happening. There were guerrilla activities and they used the civilian covers. So in order to uh, get rid of the guerrillas, the civilians also had to be hit, often cases. And this gave ground to uh, some people like Bruce Cummings, who uh, said that the war which was actually started by Kim Il-sung deliberately, after visiting Stalin twice to persuade rather reluctant Stalin the desirability of um, launching a war, they say the war, was, war had to take place. And whether North invaded or South invaded doesn't really matter. It's the atrocities that were uh, perpetrated by the ROK and American forces that really exacerbated the situation. This is the, the, the line of argument roughly uh, put, advanced by the revisionists. Anyway, this, uh, the war, war, of course, any war is detrimental, but this is a war which is a civil war, fratricidal war, which turned into an international conflict. And uh, 
the lines of conflict went back and forth a number of times. Political casualties were even greater than military casualties. You know, it's what, 37,000 Americans were killed, wounded, and at least uh, uh, 10 million uh, Koreans were hurt in one way or other, separated families, people who were killed, wounded. The worst part of it all was that this was a total war in a sense which is much uh, deeper and uh, real than uh, when we use this term total war in talking about the First or Second World Wars. Because there was no, no line between the civilian population and the military. <coughs> Many of the accounts reveal that Americans, when first they uh, came, were hit by guerrilla units dressed like ordinary Korean civilians in white garbs, which used to be worn by Koreans. So in retaliation, they sometimes hit the civilian groups thinking they were guerrillas. In my school, too, I was only in the uh, seventh grade. Students were called to mass and then uh, um, asked to volunteer. We were too young. I was very lucky to have been born not a year or two earlier. Those who were one class older than we had to be mobilized, um, and uh, we were left out, um, luckily. So even high school students later on when uh, Seoul became uh, territory of Republic of Korea, had to suffer because of the, uh, the cooperation they had to give to North Koreans. But there were also many who voluntarily went north because until then there was this illusion that North Korea was the ideal land promised by Karl Marx because most of the Korean uh, uh, Marxists became Marxists through literature spread by the uh, Japanese academic circles and some of the most brilliant uh, students and mostly from fairly well-to-do families became Marxist uh, theoreticians, whereas there were sympathizers, sort of um, indigenous growth out of resentment and uh, those who really uh, imbibe the message of dual revolution, I mean, uh, liberation. So it's rather like the Russian uh, nobility uh, who cheered the success of French Revolution having the surf orchestra play Marseillaise and not realizing their ground being undercut. Anyway, when the war ended, the casualties were enormous on both sides, but the psychological and psychic scar were much deeper than anything that um, anybody uh, who did not go through could really imagine. The physical destruction was terrible. North Korea was bombed out, and much of South Korea also was destroyed. But in often cases, in the same family, one brother would be killed by the communists, the other by the ROK forces. This happened everywhere. It all depended on where you were. Also within families, some brothers were pro-communists, wives were anti-communists, the husband the other way, and they don't spoke, didn't speak each other. There's a telling diary left by a historian named Kim Sung Chil, uh, uh, Facing History, it's called. And uh, it's a diary written in the year 1945 and also 1950 and 51. Unfortunately, he was killed in 1951. There's a very uh, revealing phrase, uh, writing um, down whatever uh, he witnessed uh, each day. He used the term, uh, 
I'll use Korean word first, 이념의 혈연화, which what he meant was that ideology was going into, uh, getting into the bloodstream of people. Ideology which is something that you had to either accept or reject on the basis of rational calculation or evaluation. No, ideology in Korea was becoming a heritage that passed from son to father. So personal revenge uh, was sort of dressed up as an ideological commitment. So it complicates the picture enormously. After the war, in the South anyway, uh, those who suffered at the hands of the communists could at least speak out. But those who weren't quite sure, who also uh, had a victim, who, uh, who had been punished by the um, Korean or South Korean side, couldn't speak up. Many families had members missing, but until the 1980s when uh, the Soviet Union began to loosen up and the uh, tension was much less here, even here, so our Red Cross could uh, advertise the names of missing persons, families didn't dare speak up that they had missing members for fear that they would be suspected of harboring pro-communist sympathy. In many cases, it was discovered that missing members had all been living under the same sky all these 30 years. So this was the kind of um, virulent anti-communist that we pursued in the well, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Of course, the situation was much worse in the North. Kim Il-sung veered sharply the other way when, uh, in 1956, Khrushchev started this move to uh, rationalize the uh, system there by making the speech on Stalin's misdeeds and the uh, East Asian, uh, East uh, European countries started to reform their system. Kim Il-sung instead got rid of all his uh, rivals. There were many uh, native Korean communists as those also who had been active in uh, the struggle for independence in China, the Soviet Union, Manchuria, and, and uh, including those who had been invited by the Soviet uh, authorities after 1945 uh, to assist building up the new state. All these were wiped out, and that included Park Kwon-yong, the leader of the, um, the uh, Communist Party, who had suffered enormously under the Japanese and had great authority. For about a year, the American uh, military government allowed free um, uh, political activities even to the communists in the hope that a genuine uh, national consensus could be worked out. But eventually, uh, knowing that he had uh, uh, been responsible for the guerrilla activity, he was, um, uh, well, his activities were um, made illegal, so he went to the North. But after the war, he, so he became North Korea's foreign minister, but he was charged with uh, espionage for the United States, and uh, he was executed. So North Korea, in that regard, followed the pattern that Stalin used in the 30s, getting rid of all his rivals. So North Korea was a much more solidly unified political system than South Korea ever was. We, after all, was a liberal democratic uh, state, and we couldn't uh, pursue repression to the extent that North Korea did. But the system was repressive enough to breed newer forces of dissidents. So it was a sort of no-win situation, and the worst part of all this was that we as a nation lost the right to exist without having to lie, that is politically, in order to survive. You had to adhere to the system, to the ideology given, and not speak your mind. I came back uh, 
to Korea in 1972, just on the eve of the uh, so-called uh, revitalization or Yushin program. Um, that was the uh, tightening of control by President Park Jong-hee. What I noticed at that time was that uh, President Park Jong-hee, whose ideological stance at that time was somewhat suspect, because he had been involved in the pro-communist activities in the early years. The Americans were not quite easy about uh, where he would go. In fact, uh, President Che Gyuhua, who just passed away, was the man who came to Korea University, where I came to teach, to persuade the professoriate of the need to uh, use, um, to push through this uh, Yushin program. That was really uh, tight control by the semi, uh, well, quasi-military government. And the argument that you, he used was basically anti-American. Because of the bad influence of America, Koreans lost nationalistic sense and uh, individualism or simply selfishness and uh, libertarianism were forces weakening this country, whereas Japan retained its nationalistic militant stance. And I was really shocked because I witnessed the transition from the Japanese rule to the American military government as a third grader. It was the first time in Korea's history that we heard of such words as autonomy, democracy, and all that. But this man was saying that because of this uh, bad influence of America, this country uh, was really getting rather shaky. Well, unfortunately, the Park Jong-hee government pursued a program of strongly anti-communist nationalist education. And I think this nationalist education uh, sank, the national emphasis on nationalism. In the grade school, in the um, kindergarten, and the, the junior levels of high school. But by the time children grow, grew and they became, say, university students, they began to see that this the system around was very repressive politically, and the communist system was just nowhere to be seen. Only in word you heard about communism. The generation of people who had lived through the war did not need to have communism explained to them. But for the younger generation, we had to do a better job of uh, educating them on why we had to oppose communism. Nothing of the sort was done. I, began, I, I kept insisting that this was going to backfire. My younger daughter in the second grade once came and said, Mom, uh, you say there are communists in the nose because you wanted us to study hard. And uh, as a <laughs> Russia specialist, I knew what was uh, happening on the eve of the Russian Revolution. My books, which contained uh, many uh, books on Russia, uh, and some even on the French Revolution, they were confiscated. So it took me six months to reclaim them, and I was able to have them released in 1972 on condition that I would donate them to the Asiatic Research Center at Korea <laughs> University. So even university students were not allowed to study about communism. Even standard Western accounts on communism were banned. But what in fact was happening was their curiosity was enormous and the curiosity was satisfied by certain type of literature, basically pro-communist. When I saw some of these um, books, from the academic stand of 
uh, uh, you know, point of view, they were so shoddy that I just thought that I could ignore them. And that was a great mistake. They became the textbooks in the underground curriculum the students used. What I noticed gradually was that while still in the 70s, my uh, lectures on uh, Russian history uh, and others, especially Russian history, was still popular. And my Harvard degree was something of an asset. But in the 80s, after the Gwangju uprising in 1980, and rather savage suppression, the situation had changed. And in the eyes of the uh, students, my American education meant that I had been sold. And this was happening at the best of the universities in Korea. So in a way, what is happening today is the price we are paying for the stupid way in which we managed our anti-communist education. So when the Soviet Union was already disintegrating from within, that is in the 80s, we ended up having uh, student movements in most of the uh, uh, major universities, the student government dominated by pro-North groups, what is called National Liberation Front, the two major um, branches, National Liberation and popular democracy, NL and PD. On the surface, they were fighting the democratization of this country, but underneath, increasingly, they were being dominated by pro-socialist or pro-North elements. And I'm quite sure North Korea did not sit idle all this time. In spite of all its weaknesses, it's a country that has maintained its a system of propaganda and uh, agitation intact. And they were reaching out. So when after the, the Olympic Games of 1988, the Soviet uh, Union uh, was really very impressed and they were very anxious to cultivate new um, ties with, uh, with Korea. The ideologue of Mr. Gorbachev, a um, man named uh, Medvedev, Roy Medvedev, came and addressed the student at SNU. And he was asked such questions. How can uh, the Soviet Union, the fatherland of socialism, abandon its course? That was in the early 90s. So, Medvedev later told me that if I had known, if we had known that this was, this was happening in Korea, we would not have taken you know, we, uh, would not have, uh, the decision to abandon communism. <laughs> well, <coughs> then, of course, what was not expected happened, that is, finally, we managed to have civilian purely civilian government elected, so-called democratization. Okay. And you saw the two former presidents being tried and uh, put into prison and all that. Democratization in that regard has been a double-edged sword. It's a very healthy development for which we are thankful in that it has given an opportunity for the opposition to get into power and have taste of power, have a new sense of responsibility. On the other hand, democratization also uh, meant that it was time to pay for the past mistakes. So the development in the 90s after the end of the Cold War in Europe has been peculiar in this country. 
And the, the Cold War meant elsewhere in, in the world that communism collapsed and the former communists acknowledged that their system failed. But in Korea, on the contrary, end of the Cold War is used as a weapon with which to discourage any sort of criticism of communist system. So anyone who is critical of North Korea is brand, uh, branded a person with a Cold War mentality. So no real ideological debate has really taken place. It just went from almost obscurantist anti-communism to pro-communist leanings. Those who, whose feelings, whose resentment, resentment had been suppressed came to, to the fore. And because we did not really teach anything about communism, how communism how communist system operated, what their history really was like. The conclusion many young people, especially those who spent all their university years demonstrating every year and not reading any decent book from cover to cover, <laughs> but imbibing this underground literature that was fed them, they just concluded that North Korea, after all, must be just the, our counterpart, only slightly poorer than we. They have no idea how that system really worked. The ringleaders of the North Korea, uh, the National Liberation Group, in fact, uh, there's one uh, 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 man named Kim Jong-han, he was smuggled into North Korea at the end of the 80s by a submarine. He was the man who wrote a pamphlet which reads like the pamphlet Lenin wrote on the eve of the um, Russian Revolution to educate the revolutionaries. Digest of Marxist notion of class struggle enormous emphasis on the need to cultivate you know, well, moral personality, dedication to the national and popular cause, all the elements that would appeal to uh, the young minds. And then there was also a part that is a sheer training for revolutionary activities, how you should behave when you are arrested and tortured and so forth. This is this man was smuggled in North Korea, but then he saw immediately that he had been deceived. So after coming back for a number of years, he tried to uh, dissolve whatever he had wrote. Eventually he confessed his mistake, and I think he uh, worked out uh, some sort of an arrangement, so he was pardoned. So now those who are most active in the so-called new right movement consists of this core group who had fought for democratic rights and then decided that North Korea was a better system than South Korea. And then they were disillusioned and awakened. So they are now spearheading the, right, uh, the movement to fight for the rights of North Koreans. But People like Kim were few. Those who, in a way, had been educated by, by him had less courage. For about half a decade after the uh, collapse of the Soviet system, the student movement here was lull, uh, as I got, went through a period of lull, and uh, they didn't know what to do. But the economic crisis of 1997 revived this current. And then with a combination of anti-communist uh, agitation that North Korea had been uh, instigating all the way, it became a force 
that suddenly saw the light. It's a combination, strange combination of the new confidence coming from Korea's economic and political successes and then sheer ignorance and lack of reliable information on the communist world that has produced this dynamite in a way. And uh, it is this force that drove our current president into power in the fall of year 2002. You recall how World Cup games produced this worldwide phenomenon of Koreans cheering, calling out the name of Tehan Minguk, the Republic of Korea. I was deeply uh, moved because it was the first time in my memory that the name Republic of Korea was being shouted out in such a unison. And I thought, finally, we had overcome the past scars. Koreans were self-confident, and uh, the past division and the scars that stemmed from it were in the past. But unfortunately, that euphoria degenerated into this anti-communist rally because of this unfortunate killing of the two young girls, accidental deaths, but this was exploited by dissident elements. So, President Ro rode into power on anti-American anti sentiment which was fanned. For the majority of Koreans, what was happening was something that was just so incredible. We thought that this was not, this couldn't happen, this was not happening, but it did happen. Because there was enough pent up resentment and anger that could be used as a fuel, it does not represent naturally all of Korean society. As you know, the it's reflected in the sharp uh, drop in the popularity rating of the president and the, the governing party. But still, there was the ground for it. It's a healthy development uh, that is uh, rewriting history. Revisionist attempt is a healthy development in the sense that voice had to be given to those whose voices had been totally suppressed for so many years. And the genuine national reconciliation called forth, called for their coming out. But on the other hand, their voices have to be correlated with the voices of the other half, who also suffered enormously. But since the power had been on one side, now the other side claims monopoly of power in that in retaliation. One of the gimmicks that North Korea has been using was this note of nationalism, this notion of autonomy, independence, and uh, the Korea, Koreans together, minjokkiri. And it's, it sounds very appealing because so much damage, so much suffering had been caused by the division and the war. So it has, uh, these slogans have enormous emotional appeal. But of course, two Koreas have gone on different paths for 60 years. And the reality is obscured. But because of the pain and because North Korea is an issue that few Koreans are really willing to face realistically, because the, it's, it's an issue that just could not be resolved. Many people had their immediate families in the north. Many, uh, many cases, a man with the eldest son fled to the south, leaving behind the families. And then the reverse happened. I have my uh, high school teachers, uh, a lady whose husband uh, was a brilliant young uh, physicist. He was taken north. They had a son who now is a professor at SNU. 
And then uh, there was another teacher who had uh, uh, come from north by himself, and his family was there. So for years, they waited because we did not know how long this division would last. They were hoping the two parts could be brought together. And they finally married each other and had a new family. But this whole thing became a real scar when the son by the husband, of a former husband, was such a brilliant student that he made the top uh, uh, in the uh, national entrance examination. And the whole thing came out in the newspaper and it was found that, found that he, his father and he had different surnames. So then countless people like that who say that they wanted unification that because unification is a cause but that no Korea, no Korean could really deny in the open. But what would happen if these families were brought together? So everybody, in a way, became sort of guilty without having committed anything specifically bad. And many people lived with bad conscience because not knowing whether your father was living or alive, you didn't know whether to start commemoration service or not. Either way, you suffered. So all these have to be aired out. So in that regard, what is happening today, the sort of a mild form of cultural revolution is a process that this country has to go through. But unfortunately, it's not going, this process is not taking place within this society without outside interference. But this North Korea's propaganda is reflected in these um, slogans. One, one of the things is, as I earlier alluded to, <coughs> dealing with the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the question of Japanese collaborators. Of course, the first generation all died out practically. But there's a strong insistence that this issue had to be dealt with. It is true, every country, France, or any country dealt with this issue, war criminals and collaborators, much better than we did. What makes the situation complicated is that North Korea is using this to denigrate the legitimacy of the Republic of Korea. So practically everyone who had been instrumental in building up this country can be charged with collaboration with uh, the Japanese because they were the people who were educated under the Japanese, had built up some sort of expertise. So I think the peak of this uh, movement, which I think was instigated from behind by North Korea, uh, uh, came last year when there was this movement to pull down the statue of General MacArthur. And uh, this, Fortunately, I think became a turning point in the general public's awareness of what was happening and how the situation was being used by North Korea. The sunshine policy of President Kim Dae-jung was a welcome note because it promised sort of resolution of this sick problem in a peaceful, palatable manner. The gist, of course, as you all probably know, is that after all, the Soviet Union and the United States, the two responsible parties for our division, are now calling themselves partners. Why should we remain antagonistic to each other, naturally? This is true. And the second, we have to, since South Korea is doing so much better, and we now have self-confidence, and no matter what, the burden of feeding our brethren in the north would fall upon us uh, in a major way. It's much better to have that system develop into a normal state functioning economy than to have it collapse upon us. So that's a system to do that. And uh, this way also, by wiping out their mistrust and fear, we can have 
peaceful coexistence and then eventually work toward unification. Faultless argument. And also the, the uh, two conditions that President Kim Dae-jung attached. That is, no provocation would be allowed and the uh, Korean-American alliance will remain strong. This would be the cornerstone. And President Kim Dae-jung used to say in public and in small circles that even Kim Jong-il agreed the desirability of continued American presence. After all, uh, it's not whether we are unified or not because of the potential threat posed by Japan and China and even Russia. So I was one of the one of President Kim Dae-jung's ambassadors, and uh, I bought the argument myself. But in the way this policy was being executed, sitting still in Moscow. I, I began to worry immediately. North Korea was using this in their own way. A former foreign minister who defected to the North, the only one such a prominent case. She was the one who was um, yeah, one of the leaders in the uh, you know, counter South uh, propagation uh, unit. And she came as the, lead, uh, the leader of the delegation. We should have rejected it, of course, rejected her. Nothing of that sort happened. And ever since, North Korea has been using, has been testing this country's awareness of what was going on. And North Korea has never given up the claim to be the only legitimate representative of the entire peninsula. So they insisted on dealing with the United States directly and uh, only in slogan they say Koreans together. But in, act in actuality, they've never really recognized South Korea as an equal. So little by little, people here began to lose the sense of God sense of fear vis-a-vis -vis North Korea, whereas North Korea, in my mind, has not changed. But because of the wishful thinking and the deception to which the society has fallen victim, people don't even feel anything if North Korea, when North Korea announced that it even tested nuclear weapons development. Anyway, history rewriting is one wedge that pro-North forces have used to convince the Korean nation that we no longer have to put up with the division and have to rewrite history from the point of view of a unified Korea, this is the argument that they use to bring up or, or uh, history in, has to be viewed in such a way that Korea is seen as a unified whole. So that makes Republic of Korea not a viable unit, but very few people see through this. So in their historiography, uh, Dr. Seungman Ri and uh, General MacArthur are the two arch culprits for the division of the country and all the tragedy that ensued. Well, as I say, the turning point was reached last year and uh, now there are forces which try to counter this wrong-headed interpretation of a history, but still the work had already been progressing for so long. The all-powerful teachers' union has been dominated by the pro-North elements. It's the wrong kind of history is being taught. So now there's a fierce battle which people refer to as South-South conflict. There's North-South conflict, but South-South conflict. And in a way, I mean, there are of course, intimately linked. And the uh, South-South co conflict is 
something that is very difficult to grasp. We do not know at this point how deeply the system has been penetrated by North Korea's agents. Only today, I think uh, there was an outright uh, comment on this in one of the major newspapers. And this kind of talk would be, of course, immediately uh, counterattacked by saying this is a Cold War mentality and so forth. But as someone who is familiar with the old uh, communist system, and not only that, you know, after all, uh, international uh, relations are such that every country is a rival, if not enemy of another. And uh, unless Kim Jong-il uh, is an absolute fool, which he's not, it would be, it was so easy to work from within this system to inculcate their way of viewing the history and the world. So in a way, uh, my talk tonight is a very painful uh, confession of the, the failure of the education system here and appeal for, for patient understanding of the, the struggle that we are waging right now. I'm afraid that if we don't understand the situation correctly, also, also I appeal to our American friends as well who, whose sensitivities are naturally enormously hurt that we are trying to, we are fighting. And uh, we don't want to have won every battle only to lose the war. Maybe my view is somewhat uh, exaggerated because I happen to have studied secret organization as part of my uh, doctoral dissertation, which just by chance I, I was working on the subject of Freemasonry as possible source of this phenomenon uh, you know as the Russian intelligentsia. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just discovered that, in fact, uh, the German court was using the secret network to ensnare Russia's Grand Duke, uh, Grand Duke Paul, who was the son and political rival of Catherine the Great. And uh, this kind of uh, secret network is one that any revolutionary groups utilize, and especially the communist systems, very effectively. In the 80s, sitting at the university, there were people who were um, sketching out the, the, uh, the uh, picture of the student movement, as I described to you. But few people believed it. For instance, uh, Pak Kong of Sogang University, the chancellor of the university at that time, was one of the few people who were uh, uh, talking about this. Everyone thought that his view was exaggerated, but it all turns out to be, to have been the case. And now there are a large number of people who had been persuaded to follow the, the Juche NL line, and who since then uh, recanted. And they now say there are many people who had been educated by them personally, and who had absorbed the uh, Pronos uh, system of thinking who are now active. So I'm very, very sorry that we have not been able to prevent this, but now we are aware of what is going on. And I think the public also is much more aware since last year of the danger we are facing. But unfortunately, our government and the governing circle seem still not quite sure of where to go, and uh, this hesitation that they show in the face of North Korea's uh, wanting to become a nuclear power is very worrisome. But I really would like to appeal our friends that Korea should not be given up. 
we do have the strength, only political power at the moment is not being used in the way in which we should. So rewriting history has this complicated background. Rewriting history was necessary and is necessary. There are many suppressed uh, chapters that have to be rewritten. Balance should be restored, but at the moment it's going to the other extreme. And uh, this explains the volatility of the intellectual scene here and uh, the enigmatic picture that this country is facing. So in a larger sense, this is a country that is going through this painful search for its identity, and I'm sure we will pull through. But right now, the situation is very, very complicated. Thank you. Thank you.